Hello. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Dave, as Gautam said. I'm a programmer and Go contributor from Sydney in Australia. Um, if you are confused, I am the Elvis on your right. <laughs> And it's, it's my honor to be your final speaker today. I've had the privilege of listening to the presentations from all the other wonderful speakers, and I now have the inevitable task that I have to, <laughs> that I have to not repeat anything that they've said. <laughs> so, as, as I, my introduction said, I've been involved in porting Go to a number of platforms. I talk uh, about Go and design. But I'm not going to talk about any of those things today. I, I hope this won't disappoint you. So I want to open my presentation with this. Most programming languages start out sim aiming to be simple, but they end up just settling for being powerful. And being passionate about Go means being passionate about language advocacy. And a natural hazard of that advocacy are statements like this. You just think too much about it. Underlying this, this tweet, I think, I think there is, there's a gem of truth. Because I can't think of any language added in my lifetime that didn't try and purport to be simple. It didn't offer simplicity as a core goal. And on the other hand, I can't think of any language introduced in that same time zone, that same time frame, with the rallying cry of more complexity, more complexity than any other contemporary language. Um, but instead, many say that they're powerful. So the idea of proposing a language with inherently higher languages, like higher levels of complexity, is laughable. Yet this is exactly what so many contemporary languages have become. Complicated, baroque messes that are really parodies of the reason that they were created. The clumsy syntax, non-orthogonality, it's just a justification for the difficulty of capturing nuanced corner cases of the language. Many of these, they're self-inflicted by years of their own, their own feature creep. And so every language starts out being simple. That's the goal. Yet so many of them fail to achieve this goal, eventually falling back on the expressiveness or the power of the language as a justification for their failure for being simple. And I ask myself, why is this? Why does this happen? Why do so many languages launched with a sincere goal of being these idealistic cults fall afoul to their own self-inflicted complexity? And one major reason I believe they do is that to be thought successful, every language should somehow include all the popular features of its predecessors. And if you would listen to language critics, they demand that any new language should push forward the boundaries of language theory. But I think in reality, this is, this is a veiled request that your new language should include all the, the bits that they really liked in their language, their old language, as well as combining all the new ideas that you have. And I think that this is fundamentally incorrect. Why would a new language be proposed if not to address the limitations of its predecessors. Why should new language not aim to be a, a refinement of the cornucopia of new features that we see and learn from the experience of its predecessors rather than just repeating their mistakes? Because language design is about trade-offs. You can't have your cake and eat it too. And so my challenge, the notion that every mainstream language must be a superset of all those that it seeks to replace. So this brings me back to my tweet and to Go. Because Go is a language that chooses to be simple. And it does so by choosing to not include many features that other programming languages have accustomed their, their users to thinking are indispensable. And so the subtext of this thesis would be that what has made Go successful is what has been left out of the language, just as much as the things that have been included in the language. Or, as Rob Pike would say it, less is exponentially more.
to continue this theme of construction that BG started yesterday, when you raise a new building, engineers first sink long pillars down deep into the bedrock to be the foundation, to a stable foundation for the structure of the building. To not do this, to just kind of sweep the area clear and lay a big concrete slab and start construction would leave this building vulnerable to subsidence, to environmental changes, to local changes in the environment. And as programmers, we can understand this parable as the, as the, the idea of a leaky abstraction. So just as tall buildings can only be successfully constructed by placing them on a firm foundation, large programs cannot be successful if they're placed on a loose covering of dirt that just masks the decades of accreted debris. And you, you cannot add simplicity after the fact. Simplicity is only gained by taking things away. And simplicity doesn't mean easy, but it might mean straightforward, or it might mean uncomplicated. And something which is simple might take a little longer, might be a little more verbose, but it will be more comprehensible. And putting this into the context of a programming language, a simple programming language may choose to limit the number of semantic conveniences that it offers to experienced programmers to avoid alienating newcomers. And simplicity does not mean easy. And achieving a design which is simple is not an easy task. So just because something is simple, we shouldn't assume it's crude. And so while lasers are amazing technology, they're used in manufacturing, they're used in medicine, when you prepare, prepare food, you just use a knife. And compared to lasers, chef's knives might be unsophisticated, but in truth they represent generations of knowledge in metallurgy, in manufacturing, even in usability, the handle. So when considering a programming language, don't mistake a lack of the latest features for a lack of sophistication. I love this quote. You should design your programs with simplicity as a goal. Not aim to be surprised when the solution just happens to be simple. And so as Rob Pike noted last year at GopherCon, Go wasn't designed by a committee. The language represents the distillation of the experiences of Robert Griesma, Ken Thompson, and himself. And only once, all three of them were convinced of a feature's utility, did they agree to include it in the language. So there's also an exponential cost to completeness. That 90% solution, one that remains orthogonal, while recognizing that some things are just not doable in the language, versus a language attempting to offer 100% of its capabilities to every possible permutation, will inherently be less complex, because we engineers know that that last 10% costs another 90% of the effort. And a lack of simplicity is obviously complexity. And complexity is a friction it's a force which is going to act against getting things done. And complexity is a debt. It robs you of the capital to invest in your future. Good programmers write simple programs. They bring their experience, their knowledge, and their failures to new designs and to learn from them and avoid those mistakes in the future. And to steal a quote from Chicky. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Go is a language that is designed to be simple. It's a feature. It's not a byproduct. It's not an accident. And this, was a this was a message that spoke to me when I first learned about Go back in 2009. And it's a message that has stayed with me for the, the entirety of my involvement in the language to this day. And the desire for simplicity is woven through every aspect of this language. So. I've talked about this, and my question to you is, do you want to write simple programs, 
or you settle for writing powerful programs. I hope that I've convinced you that a need for simplicity in programming languages is self-evident. So I want to move on to my second topic, collaboration. Is programming an art or is it a science? Are we artists or are we engineers? This, this is probably a big question, it's probably a debate in itself, but hopefully you'll humor me here that as professionals, programming for us is a little of both. We're both software artists and software engineers. And importantly, as engineers, we have to work together as a team. So there's more to the success of Go than just being simple. And this is the realization that for a programming language to be a success, it must coexist in a much larger environment. So large programs are written by large teams. This doesn't seem controversial. The inverse is also true. Large teams of programmers, by their nature, produce large code bases. And projects with big goals necessitate big teams. And their output will be commensurate with that. And this is really the nature of our work as professional programmers. Does anybody know what this is? The IBM 360. Do you know which one it is? This is a very important one. What was that? The left one. <laughs> this is one of the IBM systems installed at NASA in the time when they landed on the moon. It was responsible for calculating uh, the, the, um, yeah, the, the, all the stuff you need to go to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's big. It's a big problem. So, so go. Go is a small language, but it is deliberately designed as a language for large teams of programmers. So the small annoyances you might have when you learn Go, like lack of warnings, the refusal to allow unused inputs, the refusal to allow unused local variables, are all facets of choices designed to help Go work for big teams. And I, I don't mean to say that Go is not suitable for a single developer or for using on a small project. But it speaks to the fact that a number of the choices that, of the, the language are aimed at the needs of growing software teams. And importantly, if your project is a success, then your team is going to grow. So you better plan for that. And it might appear heretical to suggest this, as many of the metrics that we as professional software, software developers are judged on you know, number of lines changed, number of commits into source control, all accounted for, character by character, line by line, file by file. But writing a program, or I think to be more correct, solving the problem, delivering on that solution, has very little to do with the final act of typing on the keyboard. So programs are designed, they're written, they're debugged, and they're distributed in an environment that is much bigger than the editor just on your computer. And Go recognizes this. It's a language designed to work in that larger environment, not in spite of it. Because ultimately, Go is a language for problems that exist today for commercial programming. It's not just for language theory. So the author, Peter Siebel, suggests that programs are not read but instead they are decoded. In hindsight, this is fairly obvious. After all, we call it source code, not source literature. The source code of a program is an intermediate form uh, that's somewhere between the concept and the computer's executable notation. And as with many of these transformations, the encoding of the source program is not lossless. There is some loss of fidelity. There is some imprecision, some ambiguity that is present. And this is why when you read source code, you must in fact decode it to define what the original programmer was intending. And many of the choices that relate to the way that Go code is written speak to this impedance mismatch. 
the simplicity of Go, the regularity of the grammar, while providing few opportunities for individuality, in turn make it easier for new programmers to decode a Go program and determine its function. Because source code is written to be read. Go is a language that is designed from the beginning to be transposed, transformed, processed in, at the source. This has opened up new forms of analysis and code generation that we can use in the wider Go community. And we've seen several talks today on this, on the metaprogramming of analyzing Go source code, of transforming it. And these tools are really impressive. But I think the regular syntax of Go is more than that. And it has a, gr a gr greater champion. And that's Go format. But what is it that's so important about Go format? And why is it important that we Go format our code? And part of the reason is, of course, to avoid needless debate. I mean, large teams will, by their nature, have a wide spectrum of views on how code should be formatted. This is one of the most pernicious and unproductive debates. And because Go is a language for collaboration, just as in the wider community, personal choices need to be moderated for it to be harmonious, for a harmonious team, a harmonious society. And the outcome is that nearly all Go code is formatted, and it's formatted by convention. Adherence to this convention is an indicator of your alignment with the values of Go. And this is important because it's a social convention, and it leads to positive reinforcement, which is far more powerful the negative reinforcement from a chafing edict from an evil compiler writer. In fact, code that's not formatted well can be an indicator of the suitability of the package that you're looking at. Now, I'm not saying that poorly formatted code is buggy, but poorly formatted code might be an indication that those authors don't understand the design principles that underscore Go. And so, Buggy code can be fixed, but design issues and impedance mismatches can be harder to fix, especially after that code is integrated into your program. And as Go programmers, we can pick up any piece of Go code written by anyone in the world and just start to read it. We've seen heaps of examples up here written by, uh, how many people were here? 20, 24 different speakers. But it goes diff deeper than just formatting. Because Go doesn't have big, heavy libraries like the STL and Boost. There's no Qt base class. There's no G object if you're a known programmer. There's no preprocessor that's going to obfuscate things. Domain specific languages, they rarely show up in Go. The inclusion of the map and the slice in the language sidesteps most of these interoperability issues. You have integrating packages from other parts of your company or from a vendor or a third party. And all Go code uses these same basic building blocks, maps, slices, and channels. So all Go code is accessible to every Go programmer, not just ones that know that quaint dialect that you use in your organization. So to change things a little bit, in 1964, Doug McIlroy postulated about the power of the pipe for composing programs. And I think, given that's 1964, I think I'm winning the earliest quote. I think I beat BG by about four years. And this was five years before Unix was ever written. And McIlroy's observation became the foundation of what we understand today to be the Unix philosophy. Simple, sharp tools, which combine together to solve more complex tasks and importantly, tasks which were never envisaged by the original author. In these last few decades, I, I feel that programmers have lost the ability to compose programs. It's been lost behind waves of runtime dependencies, stifling frameworks, brittle type hierarchies that degrade your ability to move quickly and to experiment cheaply. Go programs embody the spirit of the Unix philosophy. Go packages interact with one another via interfaces. Packages, programs are composed, just like the Unix shell, by combining packages together. So I can use 
fprintf to, to write formatted output to, a network connection, zip file, or even a writer that just throws what I tell it away. And conversely, I can create a gzip reader that consumes data from a HTTP connection, or a string constant, or a multi-reader composed of many of those sources. And all these permutations are possible in McIlroy's vision without any of these components having the slightest knowledge of the other, of the other participants in this processing chain. Interfaces in Go are therefore our unifying force. They are the machines, they are the mechanisms of describing behavior. Interfaces let programmers describe what their package does, not how it does it. Well-designed interfaces are more likely to be smaller interfaces. The prevailing idiom is that many interfaces in Go have exactly one method. And compare this to languages like Java and C++. And interfaces where they exist in those languages are larger. In terms of method count, uh, required to satisfy them, or they're more, more complex because of their entanglement into the, packet, into the class hierarchy of those languages. But interfaces in Go have none of these restrictions. And they're simpler, and at the same time, they're more powerful and more composable. And critical to this narrative of collaboration, interfaces in Go are satisfied implicitly. Any Go type, written at any time, in any package, in, by any programmer, can implement an interface simply by providing those methods to satisfy the interface's contract. So it follows logically that small interfaces lead to simple implementations, because it's kind of hard to do it up any other way, and leading to packages which are comprised of small, simple implementations connected by common interfaces. Now, I've written a lot about the subject of error handling in Go, so I will, I will restrict my comments just to errors as they relate to collaboration. And Go's error interface is our key to Go's composable error handling story. If you've worked on big teams, you've probably come across packages like Canonical's Ergo, which provide facilities to add stack traces to your errors. Um, perhaps the project itself has implemented it, or uh, you've had to incorporate a, a language, that, uh, sorry, a library that you use in your company to do the same thing. Now, I want to be clear that I'm not taking a position on the goodness or badness of this idea. Um, of, of gift wrapping errors. But I do want to highlight that even though one piece of code you integrate might use FUMPT error F, another might use a third party package, from the point of view of, your, of you, the programmer, your error handling strategy is always the same. Check the error. If it's nil, it worked. And comparing this to the variety of other error handling strategies, that must be managed as other, in other languages as their programs grow through the accretion of dependencies. This is the key to Go's pro, a Go programmer's ability to write applications of any size without sacrificing reliability. In the context of collaboration, it's got to be said that Go's error handling strategy is the only one that makes sense. This is one of my favorites. Go's lack of make files is more than just a convenience. With other programming languages, when you integrate something, like it might be something complex like V8, or, or something more mundane, like your database driver, you're integrating that code into your program. I mean, this is, this is obvious. But you're also integrating the build system of that dependency into your build system. And this is far less visible and sometimes more intractable problem You've not just introduced a dependency on that bit of code, but you've also introduced a dependency on that code's build system. And that could be CMake, or scones, or new auto tools, what have you. And the thing that I'm most proud about is that Go simply doesn't have this problem. Putting aside this contentious issue of package versioning, once you actually have the source in your Go path, integrating any piece of third-party code is as simple as just using that import statement all you ever do. And Go programs are built from just their source, which, is every, which has everything you need to know about how to build that program. And this is hugely important, and 
underappreciated at the same time because it's part of Go's collaboration story. And there, this is also the key to Go's efficient compilation because the source itself indicates the files that need to be touched to build that program and nothing else. Does your heart sink when you want to try that latest thing from Hacker News or Reddit and you find that it needs no JS? Or maybe some assortment of Ruby dependencies that uh, they're not, oh, they're, they're the, old, the old version's available. Oh. Um, or maybe it needs Python and you now you need to look up what is the way of doing Python packaging this week? Is it eggs or wheels or pip or whatever? You can tell I'm, you know, my heart sinks when I find this. And for Go programmers, dependency management is still an open wound. And this is a fact. And it's not one that I'm proud of. But for users of programs written in Go, their life just got a whole lot easier. Compile the program, SCP it to the server, job done. Go's ability to make standalone applications and even cross-compile them means that programmers are rediscovering that lost art of actually shipping that program. That real program the one that you tested in your test environment, you ship it directly to your customers. And this one fact alone has allowed Go to establish a commanding position in this nascent container orchestration market. One that, I argue, wouldn't exist, certainly in its current form, if it wasn't for Go's, Go's deployment story. And this, this illustrates how Go's design decisions move, just, move beyond just thinking about the programmer and how the language will interact with that during that development phase and extend right through, right through that software lifecycle into the deployment phase. This Go's choice of a single static binary is directly influenced by Google's experiences deploying to their own large complex applications. And I, I really believe that we should not dismiss their advice lightly. So, C Sharp isn't portable. Really, really, it's not. It's joined at the hip to Windows. Swift and Objective-C, if you're an iOS programmer, they're kind of in the same boat. Right? They're, in, they're Apple-only programming languages. They're really popular, there's no argument there, but they're not very portable. And Java and Scala and Groovy and all those languages that you build on top of the JVM might benefit from the JVM bytecode and its independence until you realize that Oracle isn't really interested in supporting the JVM on anything but Intel hardware. And Java's also tone deaf to those requirements of the machine it's executing on. It's too sandboxed. It's too divorced from the reality of the environment it's working in. Now, Ruby and Python are better citizens in this regard, but they're hamstrung by their clumsy deployment stories. And in this new world of metered cloud deployments, which we find ourselves, where everything is charged by the minute, do you want a slow interpreted language or a nimble compiled program? So Go's fresh take on portability, without the requirement to abstract yourself away from the machine, is really like no other language available today. Excuse me for a second. Okay. For the last few decades, since the rise of interpreted languages and virtual machine runtimes, programming is less about writing small targeted tools. It's more about managing the complexity of the environment that those tools are deployed into. So slow languages, bloated deployments, encourage programmers to pile additional functionality into that one application to offset the cost of installation and setup of that application. But I believe we're in the early stage of a renaissance of command lines, a renaissance driven by the rediscovery of languages that produce compiled, self-contained programs. And I think Go leads this charge. It's a command line renaissance which enables developers to deliver simple programs that fit together, cross-platform, in a way that suits the needs of this, this growing cloud automation community. 
and reintroduces a generation of programmers to the art of writing tools that fit together, like Doug McElroy said, like segments in a pipe. And a key part of this renaissance is the deployment story. I spoke earlier and many of my, many of my fellow speakers have talked about Go's deployment of the single, the single binary. And that's, that's from the server side. But I think there's a bit more to this. Over the last year, we've seen a number of companies who shift their client-side tools from languages like Ruby and Python, we'll talk about you in a sec, um, to Go. Cloud Foundry, GitHub's Hub, MongoDB tools have all, been, have all been rewritten in Go. Every case, their motivations, I believe, were similar. While, while those tools worked, they, the support load from the customer in supporting them because they couldn't get their gems installed or they, didn't, they ran on Windows and you hadn't tested it, I mean, it was huge compared to, compared to the other support load of, of other parts of the application. So Go lets you write command line applications. They let, in turn, let developers build Unix applications according to the Unix philosophy. So we have small, sharp tools that work well together. And this is a, this is a renaissance, I think, that's been missing for a generation. So let's wrap this up. Go is a simple language. This is not an accident. This was a deliberate decision, executed brilliantly by experienced designers who struck a chord with pragmatic developers. And put simply, Go is a language for programmers who want to get things done. And Andrew Durand noted on, at Go's fifth birthday that Go has arrived as the industry underwent a tectonic shift towards cloud computing. And we're thrilled to see it quickly become an important part of that movement. And Go's success is directly attributable to the factors that motivated its designers. As Rob Pike noted in his 2002 splash paper, Go is a language designed by Google to help so solve Google's problems. And Google has big problems. Uh, but it turns out that Go's design choices are applicable to the problems that a number of us face as professional programmers. This is my favorite site. Actually, this is my home page. <laughs> Remember last year? Go turned five as a public project. And in those five years, less if you consider that 1.0 was only April 2012, as a language and as a proposition to programmers and development teams, it's been wildly successful. Witness the graph. In 2014, we had five Go conferences. In, as of February 2015, right now, we have seven this year. Plus, ever-growing engagement on social media, Twitter, Google+, I mean, William talked a lot about this, the Reddit community, IRC or Slack, if that's your flavor. Um, Go is getting featured in mainstream tech press. Who saw the, the number of write-ups in GigaOM and things like that about the AWS, uh, AWS uh, library for, for Go? Okay, two people. It wasn't actually a question, it was rhetorical. <laughs> Importantly, we've got Go training available as a professional, and also Go is making inroads in academic contexts, being taught to students. We've got over 100 meetups around the world. Francek showed his Go meetups app spot application. There are over 100 entries on that. You can't go to a, there are only 220 countries in the world, and there are 100 Go meetups. It's pretty good. Sites like Damien's Go for Vids are helping people disseminate the material that have been produced at all these meetups, at conferences like this, and they're being made available to anybody who wants to join the Go community. The, the pool is really growing. We've got community hackathon events like Go for Gala and the Go Challenge next month. So, in closing, this is a paper that, this is a paper that describes the language that we have today. It's a language built with care and moderation. It's a language that is what it is because of the deliberate decisions that were made at every step. Language design, it's about trade-offs. So learn to appreciate the care in which Go's features were chosen 
and skill that they were combined with. And while the language strives for simplicity and it's easy to learn, it doesn't immediately follow that the language is trivial to master. And there's a lot to love in our language, so don't be in such a hurry to dismiss it before you've had a chance to explore it fully. Please, learn to love the language. Really learn the language. It, it might take longer than you'd think. Learn to appreciate the choices by its designers. Because, and I really do mean this, Go will make you a better programmer.